Good morning and welcome to Cumber Methodist Church's Sunday Worship. Some words from Psalm 133. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. We worship God as we sing together Charles Wesley's hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let us pray. O God of all people, we come to worship you because you make us one great family with different gifts and abilities, ages and experiences, backgrounds and insights. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. O God of all people, we come to rejoice in your loving power, which overcomes the barriers we build between ourselves. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. O God of all people, we come to celebrate together, to receive your forgiveness of our sins, to hear your good news, and to go in your name to proclaim your love. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. God of truth and mercy, we make our confession. We have not always maintained justice in our midst. We have not always done what is right. We have not always looked for your saving help. We have often despised those who are different. We have refused a welcome to the stranger in our midst. We have mocked the devotions of others and criticized their offerings and their prayers. May we imitate the compassion and justice of Jesus holding to the truth and offering ourselves to your transforming grace. 
May we learn to see him in the humanity and faith of others, hearing the Spirit in their prayers and working with them to create a community where all belong. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our reading is from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 to 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there, because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honour accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Psalm 133 Behold, how good and how lovely it is when brothers live together in unity. It is fragrant as oil upon the head, that runs down over the beard, fragrant as oil upon the beard of Aaron that ran down over the collar of his robe. It is like a dew of Hermon, like the dew that falls upon the hill of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded his blessing, which is life for evermore. Our reading is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. 
Jesus did not answer a word. So those disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. We join in in singing the hymn, Great is thy faithfulness. Chapter 15, verse 28. Jesus answered, Dear woman, you really do have a lot of faith, and you will be given what you want. At that moment, her daughter was healed. This passage from Matthew's Gospel describes the only time Jesus went out of the Jewish territory. The disciples wanted to get rid of the woman, because she was an embarrassment to them. This woman was not only a Gentile, but a Canaanite, who were ancestral enemies to the Jews. 
Jews would have nothing to do with the Canaanites. But Jesus was not embarrassed by her. But to call a person a dog was, and still is, an insult. But the word that Jesus uses in the Gospel in the Greek is kunaria, which means a pet dog. William Barclay suggests that Jesus did not say this as an insult. The tone and the look with which something is said can make all the difference. Something that is harsh can be said with a disarming smile. You can call a friend, you old rascal, with a smile, and it takes the sting out of it, and it is filled with affection. We can be quite sure that the smile on Jesus' face and the compassion in his eyes robbed the words of all bitterness and hatred. Jesus was being witty, and his wit was returned by a witty response. Jesus was also testing the woman's faith, which grew in contact with Jesus. Because of her persistence and her faith, she was rewarded. This was the beginning of Jesus tearing down all the barriers. In the Old Testament reading, we heard how Joseph believed it was God who sent him to Egypt, not his brothers. Joseph had faith in God that God would still work out his purposes, not in spite of human beings' evil intentions, but by means of them. The church today faces many challenges. There's the ordination of gay priests and ministers, same-sex marriages, not to mention trying to find new ways of worshipping and holding communion services during the current pandemic. It is so easy to get lost in laws, rules, regulations, traditions and doctrines and lose sight of our faith. Martin Luther was a showpiece of discipline, penance and self-denial, a devout Catholic. He went on a pilgrimage to Rome and while there visited the Santa Scala, the Holy Staircase, which is a staircase of 28 steps that was brought to Rome by Saint Helena and believed to be the steps Jesus ascended to Pilate's house which the faithful climb on their knees. Martin Luther toiled up these stairs on his knees, and as he did, he heard a voice from heaven saying, The just shall live by faith. It changed his life. God wants our obedience but he also wants our faith. But what is faith? It is trusting in God, in his promises, and staking everything on his love, just as the Canaanite woman did in the reading from Matthew's Gospel. And faith is rather like learning to swim. We must not be afraid to take the plunge. Years ago I went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and one of the places that we visited was the Dead Sea. Now the Dead Sea is approximately nine and a half times saltier than seawater which makes it very buoyant and it is impossible to drown in the Dead Sea. Now, in our group of pilgrims, there were a number of non-swimmers, and they were normally scared of water. But they decided that they would go into the Dead Sea because they knew they couldn't drown. And I remember walking into the Dead Sea. 
and when you got to knee deep, you just could not stand up anymore. Your feet were taken from underneath you, and you all you could do was just to float. You couldn't swim, you couldn't get your legs down in the water to kick, and the only way you could move around was by paddling with your hands. We hear from other Christians about their faith. We see them in action, and this encourages us to take the plunge. We must take the first step. And once we have taken that first step, God gives us power. The deader the sea, the more daunting the prospect, the more buoyancy we have, the more power we receive. And God gives us the power to overcome our fear. On our pilgrimage to the Holy Land, when we got to the Sea of Galilee, the non-swimmers decided to go into the sea and learn to swim. Now, as you all know, fresh water is less buoyant than salty water and far less buoyant than the Dead Sea water. And yet, they had gained the confidence in the Dead Sea to go into the Sea of Galilee and learn to swim. When we realise that it is not our efforts, but God's grace and power which matter, then we become optimists because we are bound to believe nothing is impossible. Years ago, when I worked as a draftsman in engineering, the engineers and the salesmen were always wanting drawings done yesterday. So much so that in the end, we ended up putting a poster up in the drawing office, which read, The impossible we do at once. Miracles take a little longer. In Charles Wesley's hymn, Father of our Lord, Father of Jesus Christ, my Lord, at verse 5, Charles Wesley writes, Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, It shall be done. With God's help, all things are possible. And God delivers us from failure of self. Laws show us where we have gone wrong, but they don't help us to avoid going wrong. When something is forbidden, it becomes desirable. The stolen fruits are always the sweetest. When working with children, as I do, you soon learn never to say no and be negative. If you say, don't do this, or never do that, then nine times out of ten, what will happen is that the children will go ahead and do it. When learning to swim in a swimming pool, if you stay in the shallows, it is so tempting to put your toe on the bottom. We have to be led into deeper water where we can really swim. All through Paul's letters in the New Testament, he sets out before us two ways of being put right with God. The first is to seek a relationship with God through our own efforts, trying to obey God's laws. But Paul says, this is doomed to failure. The other way is to enter by faith into a relationship with God, which by God's grace already exists for us. And to come into this relationship 
in complete trust. God saves us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. Saved for a purpose, to go and tell others, and God will give us the power to do so. We must have faith, take the plunge, put our trust in God and learn to swim, but not panic. If we do, we will drown. Be persistent like the Canaanite woman and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The astronaut Neil Armstrong thought the greatest walk of his life was his walk on the moon. But then he found Jesus and he said his walk with Jesus was far more exciting.
let us pray. God of the deep embrace, thank you that you're a God of infinite, unstoppable love. Thank you for the comfort of knowing ourselves fully loved by you. Cleanse us of all that holds us back from receiving that love. Anoint us with it in the depths of our being and help us to freely, generously give it away. Amen. Creator, Saviour God, your good news is for all. You show mercy to all humankind. God of love, help us to tell others about you. Give us the help of your Holy Spirit that we may know the right things to say and the right things to do. We remember before you preachers, teachers and evangelists and we pray especially for Nikki, our pastor, for Michael, our minister, for Colin, our superintendent, and for all the retired ministers and local preachers in our circuit. In your loving mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, lead your church into unity. Give us the help of your Holy Spirit that we may learn to live together in love, trust and understanding so that the world might believe. We remember before you the churches here in Cumber and pray especially for the church throughout the world during the present pandemic. In your loving mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, inspire us with a vision of your kingdom, of truth and justice, peace and joy. Give us the help of your Holy Spirit as we work and pray for its coming. We remember before you those working for the oppressed and the needy. And we pray especially for all who work in the NHS and for all key workers and those on whom we rely. And we pray for peace where there is conflict, for racial and social justice to be seen throughout the world and we pray for any who are known to us who are ill. In your loving mercy hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, Saviour of the world, Amen. Our closing hymn is Charles Wesley's hymn, Give me the faith which can remove and sink a mountain to a plain.
and bless us. Look on us with kindness, so that the world may know your will, so that all nations may know your saving help. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Amen.